Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Wednesday, July or June 24th, and we will be hearing the presentation Empowerment Through Design to Create a Choice Neighborhood. There we go. Okay, for technical help during today's webcast, you can just type your questions in the chat box found in your GoToWebinar tool panel. And for your content questions related to the presentation, again, just type those in the chat box located in your webinar tool panel, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Coming up on your screen is a list of our sponsoring chapters and divisions for 2020. So thanks to all of those APA chapters and divisions for sponsoring and making these webcasts possible and free to their members. Today, in particular, we are sponsored by the APA's Urban Design and Preservation Division, and we will hear a little bit more about that division in just a moment from Margaret Rifkin. So thanks to them for sponsoring today. Coming up next on your screen is a screenshot of our uh, webpage. If you head over to ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast, this is what you'll find. It is our webcast schedule, so you can just click on any of these links and you can register for our upcoming events. Um, we are actually booked all the way through November um, and we are starting to add Wednesdays and Thursdays now. So you will notice some of those starting to pop up, not just Fridays. Um, so if you go to our webcast webpage, you can also click on the prior webcast tab and that's where we have PDF copies of all of our presentations. The distance education tab, if you click that, you can get more information on our on-demand sessions that we have available through the end of this year. 1.5 uh, ethics and 1.5 law. So you can view those at your leisure and get those counted for credit. Um, so be sure to check out our webcast webpage for all of the updated information that you need. Today's webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing, and you can log your CM credits by heading over to planning.org, log into your My APA account, and from there you can either search by today's title or the event number. The event number is listed there. If you don't get a chance to write them down, just head over to our webcast webpage. All that information is on there so that you can get those credits logged. Be sure you like us on Facebook. Just search Planning Webcast on Facebook. That's where we list any changes or updates or new listings for you to register. So be sure to like us so that you can keep super up to date and you don't have to go directly to our webpage just to see what's going on. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, just head over to YouTube and search Planning Webcast. We'll pop up. So click that red button and subscribe to us along with our over 3,000 other subscribers. We have over 300 videos recorded and awaiting for you to view. So be sure and uh, like us on YouTube too. I think that's it for my housekeeping items. So I am now going to turn it over to Margaret Rifkin of the Urban Design and Preservation Division to kick things off. Margaret. Thank you. Welcome from the Urban Design and Preservation Division. As Chris told you, I'm the director of our webinar program. First, I. I'd like to speak for the leadership of our division. <clears throat> we are heartbroken by the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery, and call for an intensified effort to address inequity, injustice, and racism in our professions and practice. <clears throat> As planners, urban designers, and preservationists, we engage people in shaping the public realm and telling our history. In doing that work, we will act in solidarity with others to amplify the voices of people of color in the community and in our professions, acknowledge the perspectives and contributions of people of color, identify and avoid negative bias, and discern and oppose inequitable policies, plans, and laws. As the division leadership, we are preparing an action plan for our division exactly to put our words into actions. With that, um, we are, we would like to give you an update on our division's upcoming webinars. 
We've expanded this year's offerings, knowing that many of you will not be able to attend professional development activities in person due to the pandemic. So coming in July, well, this is today. Today is June 24th. We're gonna, this is the webinar for today, Empowerment Through Design to Create a Choice Neighborhood with Adam Rosa. Coming up in July, we have a webinar on the leading edge in trees, stormwater management and urban design, which includes the latest research and technology concerning how to keep those trees healthy. And we're gonna hear from Al Key from Deep Root which has extensive experience throughout North America. In September, we're going to have a series of two webinars from one of our favorite lawyers and art experts, Sarah Conley Odenkirk. You will learn about the public art life cycle from the very beginning, all the way through maintenance and decommissioning. Then in October, we're going back to the streets we're going to look at shared streets and flush streets and accessibility considerations, which tool design has been leading the way on um, creative work on addressing. We also have a webinar that we're in the process of scheduling, which talks, which is about programs that help longstanding local businesses, which are known as legacy businesses. These, as you know, are important to not only our social fabric, but to neighborhood character and community identity. And that will be led by Dr. Elizabeth Morton. Today, we have Adam Rosa, who's the founder of Collabo, which is a planning and urban design practice that specializes in neighborhood revitalization projects. Over his 20 year career, Adam has focused on serving people and places in need with a focus on local empowerment and implementation. He has had the opportunity to work with many different communities across the, across the country and develop strategies that capture the culture, the spirit, and the potential of the local place. Projects that he's led have received numerous awards at the local, state, and federal level. Adam has been honored as one of Next City's 40 Under 40 Vanguard, which is a really, really cool group of people that are honored each year. Adam is also a strong proponent for local improvements throughout his city of Chicago. And he's currently serving as the president of Hawthorne Neighbors, a neighborhood association in the Lakeview community. Welcome, Adam. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I really uh, appreciate you having me, Margaret and Christine. Uh, it's it's really funny to look at that photo. My hair was about four inches shorter back mm -hmm. in those days. So I think we've all uh, we've all changed a little bit over the last few months. But you know, I'm really excited to be here and to share with you a lot of what I've learned over the last you know ten or so years in working in communities throughout the country. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here, and we're going to get rolling. All right. Christine, are we good with that? Yep, looks good. All right, excellent. Well, just a special shout out definitely to the APA Urban Design and Preservation Division for hosting this event. And for all 363 of you for being here today, I really appreciate that. Uh, you know, I know there's a lot of competition between people's time during these this day and age. Uh, there's a lot of webinars, there's a lot of different things to go online for. So I really appreciate you all for being here. So this presentation is really gonna focus on empowerment through design to create a choice neighborhood. But before I get into talking about myself and, and my practice and, and what I've done over the last few years, I, I thought it was really important to uh, really represent one of, the, one of my favorite community members. This is Senora Villa Real from Brownsville, Texas. She was a community ambassador with our uh, Brownsville Buena Vida Choice Neighborhoods Plan, which uh, I led and we completed a couple years ago. Uh, Mrs. Villarreal, is a, she was a Mexican citizen. She was born in uh, Victoria, Tamal Tamaulipas, Mexico in the 1940s. She's a married mother of two sons, four grandchildren, and she was a resident of the Buena Vida development, which is the public housing site since 1990. 
So she has deep roots in Brownsville and in the community. And at one of the very first uh, community events that we had, which happened to be a big block party in the neighborhood, Mrs. Villarreal got up on stage, she grabbed the mic and she said, si no están en la mesa, están en el menu, which means if you aren't at the table, you're on the menu. And I just thought that was a tremendous quote that that really just gets to the root of everything that we do as planners, as urban designers, as people who serve neighborhoods. So it really set the stage for the process that unfolded in Buena Vida and in Brownsville. And it, I think it sets the stage for this presentation here today. So what is Choice Neighborhoods? So it is a it is HUD's initiative for place-based revitalization. And it uh, began in, oh, sorry, okay. It began uh, about 10 years ago, and it was a kind of a offshoot of the previous program, which was HOPE 6. And HOPE 6 really looked at primarily the, the public housing site itself and looking at how to transform it into mixed income housing. Choice Neighborhoods really expands beyond that model and incorporates these three key elements, which is the housing, the people, and the neighborhoods. So it's not only just looking at distressed public housing, but it's looking at the neighborhood around it and how to connect people to opportunity, and then really trying to develop people projects that will improve the quality of life for residents throughout the community. So, I've had the opportunity over the last few years to really uh, serve and, and work with, with about eight different neighborhoods throughout the country on Choice Neighborhoods Initiative projects. Uh, I led these projects at my previous firm, Camiros, which is an urban planning practice here in Chicago. And I have really tried to take a lot of what I've learned through, through these projects into my, my new endeavor, which is Collabo Planning in, in urban design, which I started in, in February of this year. And I know that's just tremendous timing with everything that's going on in the world, but uh, either way, uh, from, from the outset, I was able to lead Choice Neighborhoods projects in Rockford, Illinois, uh, which really looked at uh, working on, on the west side of Rockford in a, a distressed community that really had not seen much investment in decades. I uh, then moved down to Austin, Texas, which was a completely different story, working on the east side of Austin uh, in an area that was experiencing tremendous gentrification. It was a, the historic African-American community of Austin. Uh, from there, I had the opportunity to uh, work in Mobile, Alabama, in a, in a neighborhood that was originally built for uh, military. So over a thousand units of housing, which were focused primarily on, on soldiers in the old days, but then transitioned into public housing and really trying to re-envision an entire new neighborhood in Mobile, Alabama, uh, connected to a new reinvestment of a uh, Airbus facility that was going in uh, less than a mile away. I then went up to Flint, Michigan and worked on the Choice Neighborhoods Plan in Flint, which was a, uh, a tremendous experience. It was a real challenge. Halfway through the process is when the, the Flint water crisis uh, hit the national airwaves. So we really tried to work hard at turning crisis into opportunity and looking for ways that residents could benefit from reinvestment that would be coming to Flint. Uh, from there, I worked in, in Brownsville, Texas, right on the border of Mexico. And that's one of the, the stories that I'm going to be telling today, the work in Brownsville. Uh, more recently in Huntington, West Virginia, in the heart of coal country, working on a, a choice neighborhoods plan that really uh, connected in with Marshall University and some of the other amenities that were uh, in, in uh, close proximity in Huntington. And that's another uh, project that I will feature today in the presentation. I then had the opportunity to work in Shreveport, Louisiana, helping them implement their choice neighborhoods plan and looking at ways to bring resources to the neighborhood that uh, Shreveport was recently granted a $30 million implementation grant from HUD to move their, move their plan forward. So I'm really excited about what's been coming out of Shreveport. And uh, over the last few months, I, I had the opportunity to kick off a new choice neighborhoods plan in Rome, Georgia, 
Uh, unfortunately, we had to kind of hit pause on that in late March and early April because of the, because of COVID in terms of community engagement, but hopefully they'll be rolling along soon. So thinking about choice, it really uh, focuses on these three areas, which is the revitalization of a target housing site, which could either be public housing or assisted housing. Uh, doing it in the context of a larger neighborhood plan that looks at improvements to infrastructure, parks and open space, commercial, economic development, transportation, th things like security and safety and cleanliness in the neighborhood. And then those people projects, which I think are really critical to the, the overall recipe, which is the economic empowerment, uh, the security, the arts and culture, and all those things that improve quality of life for residents. So what I'm gonna focus on in this presentation are really these three core elements, which is listening and learning, engaging to empower residents, and partnering and building. And I'm gonna do it through the lens of, of urban design and historic preservation, but there's a lot of overlap on, on uh, more of a comprehensive effort. So we're gonna go ahead and start down in Brownsville, Texas. So the neighborhood we were working on in Brownsville, it was called the Buena Vida neighborhood. And let's see if I can, all right. So this is the Buena Vida neighborhood here in the foreground. It is within close walking distance of downtown Brownsville, which is right here. It is also only about four or five blocks from Matamoros, Mexico, which is right here. This is the Rio Grande River that kind of snakes through and separates Brownsville, the United States from Mexico. So uh, it's a really dynamic cross-cultural community. The Buena Vida development, which is the public housing site that was owned and operated by uh, the housing authority of the city of Brownsville is right here in the foreground. Uh, it was about 13 acres. It was built in the 1940s. It takes up about four city blocks overall and about 150 units of housing. So beginning the process, we thought it was really important that, to get ex people excited. So we had a block party to kick it off. We had over 500 people attend. Uh, and it really helped me understand the community, and the dynamics and the culture and the, the heritage. So, uh, you know, having these, these beautiful Mexican dancers, um, having the music, having the food, getting people involved in a way that was really authentic to the neighborhood itself. But also taking that opportunity to get some feedback and just really at, at the start kicking things off. All right, what should, what should the branding of this project be? What should the logo look like? Because this needs to represent the culture of that neighborhood itself. So we got a lot of great feedback through that initial kickoff session. And listening and, and learning more about Buena Vida and, and really what makes it tick. Again, it was built in the 1940s, so it, it's really the oldest public housing site in Brownsville. Uh, we were able to spend some time with residents touring the site, uh, going into units, taking a look at it. The, the housing authority really maintains the property very well and the residents care for it, but it really is uh, has some kind of structural and design deficiencies which make it a, uh, a good opportunity for reinvestment and redevelopment. So these are some of the, the issues with a, a historic property, a historic public housing site built in the 1940s. Uh, so you have uh, dwelling units that don't feature insulation. Uh, there's issues with the infrastructure. We have uh, things that don't meet windstorm requirements, especially in a hurricane prone part of the country. And you can see the, the flooding that occurs there on the site in the, in the lower right hand corner. So. Our, our process was really to help alleviate a lot of those issues and to redesign and rebuild uh, the Buena Vida development in the context of a larger neighborhood improvement effort. So looking at the surrounding neighborhood, uh, Buena Vida, or Brownsville is one of the poorest uh, communities in the United States. And Buena Vida is probably the, uh, the lowest income community within the city of Brownsville. Uh, so you you do have a lot of scenes like the one here on, on screen where you, you have uh, single family homes that are uh, in various states of disrepair. Uh, in a lot of these places, you have families that are actually living off of behind the properties, off of the alleys. Um, and and you have, you know, large groups of people living in homes like this. There's also a, a one one thing we learned from listening to residents and experience, experiencing it 
is that you have issues that you don't have in other communities. Uh, like there's a, a very large wild dog population that causes a, a distress for local residents if they're trying to walk around the neighborhood. So that was one of the things that we tried to address during the process. You also have many uh, very well-maintained single family homes and properties uh, such as the one on the screen here. One of the urban design elements that I thought was very interesting working in a, a border town like this is the, the fencing along the front property lines of each, each, uh, potent, each property. You have things like the, the wrought iron fencing, you have things like more of, the, more of the utilitarian fencing here, but it's something that is really, very uh, inherent to Mexican American communities. And so we tried to think about how to, how to um, incorporate that into the, the urban design fabric of the plan. Also many historic uh, commercial buildings, some mixed use development, a large number of mom and pop businesses throughout the neighborhood. So this is a, a historic uh, vacant building a few blocks from the, the Buena Vida property itself. So we, we really tried to think about how to take these assets and transform them into opportunities for redevelopment for local, for local residents. Also some really major amenities like the Brownsville Museum of Fine Art, which is about a 10 minute walk from that public housing site. Uh, they were a great partner throughout the process and we had a number of meetings there. There were a number of art focused engagement efforts where residents could come and learn how to paint and express themselves. And we incorporated that into the overall fabric of the plan itself. Across the street from the, the public housing site, we had a a uh, vacant public school that uh, we thought was a tremendous opportunity again to potentially create a wellness center for residents if they were able to safely cross that street, uh, utilize the resources that could be available at that school building. So thinking about adaptive reuse in the context of these larger improvement efforts. So engaging and empowering was the, the absolute critical ingredient to the mix. Uh, we worked with a large number of community ambassadors, which were uh, people who really identified themselves as uh, folks that wanted to become leaders in the neighborhood. And these are public housing residents who really have probably never had a, a strong voice in the community before. Through the Choice Project, we were able to actually pay them stipends for their time and their energy and their effort. They became part of the team and we we did a uh, pretty high amount of training and capacity building and empowerment at, throughout the process but especially in the beginning to get them comfortable get them up to speed but honestly we learn more from them than they learn from us so having that group to act as the go-between from the consultant team and the housing authority with the residents of the neighborhood and the community was incredibly uh, important to the effort. And I need to give a shout out here to Paula Aguirre, who is one of our partners on the plan for Borderless Studio. Because we were in a border town, we, we really conducted the entire process in Spanish. And Paula really was uh, incredible at um, really being able to translate a lot of the, the different ingredients into um, terminology that people would understand throughout the process. So we had our ambassadors not only uh, facilitate and do things like that and go out and do surveys of the community, but we helped, we had them help us research the history and the culture of the community. And so we had an entire visioning month where we talked about the past, present, and future. And these are some of the snapshots from the past of Buena Vida because it's so important to build upon the past when you're thinking about the present and the, and the future. So we not only uh, did research and, and exhibits, but we also did interviews with uh, older residents of the community to really get a sense of what made the neighborhood tick from their perspective. So this is Sarita Martinez, uh, who, lived in, who lives in Buena Vida from 1998. And you can see some of the artwork that was done uh, there behind her. You can see some of the photos that she brought to uh, really tell her story, which is really gets to the root of historic preservation. You're, you're not just preserving buildings and places, but you need to preserve the, the message and the story from the community itself. We also made a really strong effort to work with the young people of the community. 
both the residents of the public housing site and the residents of the surrounding neighborhood. We interviewed them and then we had them tell their story about what they wanted the future to be like in the neighborhood and some of the things that they wanted to see um, in terms of reinvestment in the community. Uh, this is one of the, the pictures that I love because it's our community ambassadors really taking the baton from the consultant team and becoming the leaders in the process. So this is one of our ambassadors presenting a lot of the information during the visioning month to her neighbors. So it, it lets us kind of take a back seat and uh, the ambassadors themselves actually start to speak and tell the story of the community to, to the, their neighbors and, the, and their community itself. Uh, here's another one of our ambassadors. Once we started to get into the design process for the site, explaining some of the different concepts in a way that people would understand, um, thinking about how do we really redesign that property, but doing it in a way that's going to benefit the local residents and not displace them, and really getting meaningful feedback and engaging them to empower themselves. So this is a, the the entire group of our community ambassadors, and they were actually recognized by the city of Brownsville for their tremendous work on this project. So I think it's really important to show that. Uh, you can see uh, Mrs. Villarreal there in the in the front holding up the holding up the, um, the certification. So having them become the champions of the plan was critical to the success in carrying out a lot of the changes that residents want to see. So partnering and building in Brownsville, uh, one of the, this is a, about a couple months into the process, we took one of the formerly vacant buildings and we turned it into the Choice Neighborhoods Headquarters. So again, you can see our ambassadors front and center here with the housing authority and cutting the ribbon on that, that, that particular uh, space. So we kind of cleared out the inside of the unit. We were able to set it up in a way that would really be a home base for the project. And it was a great way for people to engage in a more informal fashion where they could come in, see what was going on, get some, give some feedback. We had really about a hundred meetings in there with local partners and uh, people throughout the process. There were also a lot of activities that happened at that headquarters um, in terms of programs that would benefit residents. We had things like citizenship classes, we had youth classes, we had uh, English as a second language classes that all were hosted at that particular site. So thinking about that, those historic places and how we can reuse them and activate them to meet the needs of the current residents. We actually, we did a lot of early action through the process as well. The Choice Neighborhoods Plan is about a two year long effort. So it's really important to keep people engaged and to build momentum. And the best way to do that is to, for people to see visible changes happening in their community and to get people involved in making those changes. So here we have some of the local teens uh, cleaning up some of the graffiti on, uh, on a commercial business a few blocks away from Buena Vida. Uh, we, we really focused a lot of our early action on uh, a local neighborhood park, which is about three blocks from the public housing site called Edelstein Park. Edelstein Park was a kind of a no-go zone at the start of the process. Uh, had a lot of homeless, a lot of drug dealing. Kids didn't feel safe playing there and families didn't feel safe bringing their children there. So we really focused a lot of our activities, our improvements on how to make that park a more vital part of the, the community. So things like uh, back to school activities, Zumba classes, in the upper right hand corner, you can see the installation of the little free library. We we're able to uh, bring free Wi-Fi to the park. So a lot of these things are smaller uh, kind of bits and pieces, but they add up to a lot in terms of really reactivating a space and getting people involved and having them see the tangible change that can happen as part of a bigger planning process. And it doesn't hurt that we have the, the luchadore there to help uh, celebrate the park, you know, really pulling off the local culture and getting people involved in a way that, that was really authentic, I think made this plan a success. So learning everything that we did from both the community ambassadors as well as all the, the neighborhood residents, we put together our vision 
uh, which you can really see here. It includes a number of different both people, housing, and neighborhood projects throughout the community. Um, physical improvements like improving walkability and crosswalks and uh, planting trees, street lighting was really important, uh, putting together spaces for young people to uh, have active recreation, enhancing the commercial development in the neighborhood, but then also looking at the reinvestment of that public housing site itself, which is the the heart right in the center of, of the photo here. So looking, getting into the visioning, getting into the urban design of, of that site, uh, the first thing we did was have a, a kind of a charrette-based workshop with residents, again, led by those community ambassadors where we, we broke up into teams and everybody had the opportunity to really re-envision the Buena Vida development and think about the activities they wanted to see, how the open spaces work, how the circulation works through the site. So all those teams help to help to work uh, hands-on using uh, you know monopoly houses and icons. You can see there's very few words on these uh, on these on these posters because we wanted our engagement to be really uh, bilingual and nonverbal and doing it in a way that everybody could understand what was going on. And then we had the residents really present their ideas to the group. We took those ideas and, and we created four themes for the reinvestment of the Buena Vida site. Um, and we, we tried to theme them around different topics. So we had the community campus, we had the, uh, the four villages, the central park and the sister parks. But in each of these, there, there's, a, there's definitely a, an urban design framework that looks at breaking up the super block and and doing it in a way where you have more street frontage and kind of smaller development sites we really wanted to define those open spaces whether as one large open space or a variety of smaller spaces that each of the blocks could really call their own and then looking at a variety of housing types where right now you just have really one housing type and either a one-story or a two-story um, apartment so we wanted to look at townhomes and we wanted to look at other types of housing opportunities that could come onto the site but doing it in the context of this larger neighborhood was really critical okay. so this is what the the vision really uh boiled down to in terms of the buena vita cell, uh, site itself so really looking at a central park theme uh, anchored by a community building. So again, all those people projects we, that we want to incorporate with choice, they could all happen at that community building or they could happen across the street at that vacant school site and really trying to create that strong connection where it's not public housing on one side and the neighborhood on the other, but it's very integrated. One of the things we learned from residents is that they wanted a space where they could stroll in the evenings, which is really the only time of day where it isn't 90 to 100 degrees in Brownsville. So creating that Paseo network was a, a way to break up that super block and, and create usable um, active and passive recreation spaces throughout the site. And this is a, a visualization of what that could look like and what that could feel like in the context of that larger redevelopment. So you see the new housing, but you also really see the place-based design improvements that capture that spirit of the community. This is another uh, view from the looking at from the outside of the development towards uh, the new redesigned Buena Vida. So looking at the bicycle infrastructure and the street crossings, we really wanted to narrow down that that street that fronted on uh, the site and uh, create an opportunity for mixed use development where you had the ground floor retail and commercial and service space that could be potentially um, a flexible space for residents to open up their own businesses and for providers to come in and, and really uh, provide new services for the community itself. So all of this kind of came together in the plan. Uh, the housing strategy, we went from looking at 150 units at Buena Vida to trying to replace it with about 320 units of mixed income housing, not only at the Buena Vida site, but in other locations throughout the community. So the, the Housing Authority of Brownsville took the, the first the effort towards the first phase of housing in 2018. Uh, they were able to get a low-income housing tax credit award for uh, 
the the point the poinsettia gardens at boca chica development which was about a, a mile away from the original buena vita site so once this is complete many of the residents from buena vita will be uh, temporarily moving into this property uh, while the new buena vita um, comes to fruition based on new resources so again that that's the story of the buena vita uh, choice neighborhoods plan and you can really see how the residents were engaged throughout the effort to make this a reality and that implementation isn't just a one-step deal but it it takes a number of years to then bring the resources to help fulfill that vision that the community wants to see so now i'm going to shift over uh change pace a little bit and talk about huntington west virginia so huntington is the it's it's one of the largest cities in west virginia it's either the largest or the second largest depending depending on the year and it, it sits on the ohio river just across the the river from ohio huntington is really in the heart of coal country uh, and they've had a number of challenges in recent years especially related to the opiate uh, epidemic that is a major issue in many of our uh, both urban and rural communities huntington also has a a number of really strong community assets, not the least of which is Marshall University and a really strong medical base. So the community that we were working in Huntington was called the Fairfield neighborhood. And in the old days, Fairfield, about half of it was designated as white and half of it was designated as black. And there was a, a really strong line of uh, segregation between those two sides. So a lot of this effort was really thinking about that history and trying to break down the barriers while building off of the surrounding assets <clears throat> in the community. So just to give you a little context here, our target housing site was the former Northcott Court site right here, which is on Hell Greer Boulevard, which kind of runs um, north and south through the neighborhood. One of the big anchors, again, was Cabell Huntington Hospital, which is right in this location. Uh, expanding regional medical center that really supported a lot of the not only the the urban part of Huntington but the rural kind of hinterlands of that part of West Virginia. Then we have Marshall University, which is right on the other side of the railroad tracks, right here. Uh, downtown Huntington, which sits a few miles away uh, up the river in this location. So again, starting with the the listening and the learning process was was incredibly important. So Northcott Court was built in the in 1940. So again, it's a it was definitely an older public housing site. It uh, sat on about four acres of land and about 130 units of housing. And this is what it looked like in the old days. Uh, probably shortly thereafter, uh, it was initially built. So in 2014, before we got involved in the process, HUD uh, HUD accepted an application to demolish that site based on a lot of the structural and design deficiencies that were apparent in the buildings and the site itself so when we came into the plan uh, the northcott court site looked a little bit like this so generally a blank slate although there, there were a few uh, buildings in the background here that remained this was the old community building from the former public housing site but you can see looking down Hal Greer Boulevard here, the main dragon through town, you can see Cabell Huntington Hospital right in the foreground here. Um, as we were starting the process, there was also another planning process underway that was looking at a complete streets approach to improving Hal Greer. And you can see right now it's three, four, five lanes wide. It's difficult to for residents to get from one side to the other, it divides the community. You have a lack of street trees and wide sidewalks and that those design features that you would want. So it was really interesting to work with uh, Stantec on incorporating what they were doing in terms of the complete streets into our larger choice neighborhoods planning effort. So uh, taking a tour of the neighborhood and listening and learning from residents and stakeholders, you can really see a lot of the, um, some of the challenges that had to be addressed in terms of the uh, the vacant homes and the dilapidation and a lot of the neighborhood itself and thinking about how do we 
build off of some of the, the larger citywide efforts to deal with some of these kind of inherent issues in, in a, uh, a neighborhood that with a shrinking population. But also thinking about the, the great opportunities and the building blocks, um, Marshall University, right before we began the process, uh, constructed this uh, new, new medical facility right across the street from the public housing site which is a, a new pharmacy school. So all of a sudden there's more students that wanna be living in, in or around the Fairfield neighborhood. This sets kind of the context in terms of design and scale for that corridor itself. And it's a building block for what can happen as long as we were to ensure that residents could benefit from these changes. Listening and learning about the history and the people that lived in the Fairfield community from the start. So, a lot of residents that, that really uh, have a national scale in their importance. On the left, Carter G. Woodson, he's an American historian, author, and journalist, the founder of the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History. So he was one of the first African-Americans to really study the African diaspora. And uh, you can see there's a statue there uh, right on Hal Greer that, that um, represents his contributions to Fairfield. And then in the lower right-hand corner, you have Hal Greer himself, who was a 10-time NBA All-Star and a member of the 50th anniversary All-NBA team. So these are folks that grew up in the neighborhood. So again, historic preservation is not just about the buildings, but the stories of the people that lived there. And one of the tremendous stories that we were able to learn that I was not aware of before coming into the project was about a woman named Memphis Tennessee Garrison. And she has one of the all-time greatest names that, that I've ever heard. Uh, she was an educator and NAACP activist. And Memphis Tennessee Garrison was born in Virginia in 1890. She was the daughter of former slaves. Uh, she ended up being an activist for African Americans and young women during the Jim Crow era in rural West Virginia. She was a teacher and a community mediator. She was famous for organizing West Virginia's third chapter of the NAACP in 1921. She organized the Girl Scouts for African-American girls in the neighborhood. She created a breakfast program for impoverished students during the Great Depression. Uh, she created a Negro artist series for Appalachian artists. And her house really serves as an institution that validates Huntington's black community and as well as a remembrance of her work and her activism. So as we started the project, her house was vacant, but we, we thought it was an important historic element that we could build upon in thinking about our larger neighborhood improvement strategy. So another space that was really near and dear to the neighborhood was uh, this space, which is the A.D. Lewis Community Center. And uh, it, was, it was constructed, I think, in the, the 50s or 60s. The main portion is, a, is this gym, but it, it houses a number of after-school activities and other um, other recreational activities for area youth and for area residents. So we had all of our community events there because it, it really serves at the heart of the neighborhood itself. Uh, we had an opportunity to work with the, the people who manage the facility and we wanted to think about in our process how we could improve this as the heart of the community and build upon it and create a, a greater amenity for the residents. So at that, at that community meeting that I just showed, uh, we, we did a opportunities and challenges exercise. And the, the number one challenge we heard throughout, and it was really heard loud and clear, was the lack of a grocery store in the neighborhood. And this is something I would say in all eight of those choice neighborhoods that I showed previously, this is a key challenge. In a lot of, um, in a lot of minority communities, there's a lack of significant grocery stores. And it, it hurts not only as a, an element of a food desert, but it really signifies that the, the neighborhood is in some ways lesser than, where you don't have an amenity that many other neighborhoods take for granted. Uh, so one of the goals of this project was to see how we could recruit a grocery store and bring it to the neighborhood. Uh, we, we centered our market study on that grocery store effort and looked at how to not only tap into the resident, base, but also all those folks that live, that uh, work at Marshall University and work at the hospital, how could they become customers of this grocery store that would benefit the neighborhood? 
So engaging to empower, uh, we're able to bring on three community ambassadors through the project. On the left here is Teresa Johnson. She, she moved to the Fairfield neighborhood in 1979, and uh, she opened a child care facility. She's been very active in the community throughout those years with both children and single parents. Uh, with her husband, she's been able to foster a large number of young people in the community and to provide them safe and secure housing um, as they're growing up. So she's already a hero of mine and being able to work with her and help her grow in, in, into an even more um, important piece of the neighborhood, I think was, was a really a tremendous opportunity. And we couldn't do it without one of my partners on the right, Naomi Davis from Blacks and Green. Um, she is based here in Chicago and I've worked with Naomi on a number of projects. She's a, a, a incredible um, communicator and an incredible um, optimist in terms of working in African American neighborhoods and really helping them see the potential uh, that could be inherent in the community itself. So with Teresa and, and some of our other team members, we were able to engage the local young people of Spring Hill Elementary and get their perspective on the community and really what makes it tick and how do we improve it from their perspective, the area in and around the school. But we also took a, a real focus at working with the, the elders and the senior, senior residents of Fairfield and learning from them about the history and uh, what makes it difficult for them in terms of uh, getting to local services, the lack of transportation, the uh, safety and security issues related to the lack of lighting and poor sidewalks and things like that. So I, I really uh, want to encourage everyone to really cast a wide net in their engagement and make sure you're not missing any folks like uh, the people here at, from the senior center when you're when you're going out and doing your planning work. So getting into the partnering and building, I'm gonna show you a few of the kind of before and after images here. So Spring Hill Elementary, where we learn from the low, from those uh, from those young people is really in the foreground, or I'm sorry, in the background of the shot here. And you can see it's kind of tucked away. It isn't really a prominent location or prominent um, presence from the street. So we wanted to re-envision how that could work uh, with a kind of a grand staircase and gateway going up to the elementary thinking about how do we do an enhanced community garden up there, uh, making it a more vital part of the neighborhood, but also simple things like improving those crosswalks so children can get safely to and from school, renovating some of the single family homes directly around the school itself. <clears throat> this is back over on Hal Greer. So we have the, uh, the Northcott Court site, which is on the left of the shot here. You can see the big vacant site. The A.D. Lewis Community Center was kind of tucked away back here on the right, a big uh, vacant site right up on the sidewalk. And you can see that new Marshall University facility here and the, the hospital in the background. Well, the community really envisioned this in a different way. So uh, on the left side, the, the redeveloped Northcott Court site, having mixed use that would really come up to the sidewalk with new infrastructure, um, new different types of units for uh, the residents of today and tomorrow, but also the, the grocery store is a key element here, uh, placed closer to the hospital itself, uh, doing it in a, a two-story format where you had parking on the roof of the grocery so it fit into this more constrained urban site, incorporating those streetscape, great streets improvements on Hal Greer, and then thinking about A.D. Lewis, since it's the heart of the community, bringing it out to the community and bringing it to the sidewalk so it isn't just tucked back in there and trying to rebuild and uh, and redesign that, that property to be an even more integral part of the neighborhood. So we were able to work with an architecture firm out of Chicago called Landed Bone Baker. And uh, we worked hand in hand with them to re-envision what A.D. Lewis could look like and reprogram it. So renovating the existing building, which is in the back, but then creating a new facility up along the street with a, an enclosed walkway connecting the two spaces and keeping the existing pool and a lot of the other amenities around it. So that was something that was really important to the community to see how that particular site could be transformed. Some of the other uh, views in the neighborhood. So this was uh, some new student housing on the left side built over near the hospital. 
uh, one of the, the only neighborhood parks here, kind of in a dilapidated state. So the community wanted to envision how Prendell Park could be uh, more attractive and usable space, not only for the residents of Fairfield, but to bring in people from outside the community so they could see what was, what was great about the neighborhood. Uh, right now they come here if there's a league going on and uh, they get a look at it and they say, well, they're, they're kind of left with negative perceptions. So how do, we, um, how do we improve those perceptions in the neighborhood? And then uh, one area of the neighborhood on 20th Street had a handful of nice historic buildings. And we wanted to think about how we could bring those back to life. So this view just shows how, how we could uh, preserve the brick building on the right side and do adaptive reuse and bring some new uses like a, a coffee shop or a, a resident owned restaurant. Uh, things like murals to celebrate the culture of, of the Fairfield neighborhood here and here. And then looking at other opportunities for infill mixed use development, which could help strengthen that corridor and that area as a neighborhood commercial node. Uh, an old vacant school in the neighborhood, which is <clears throat> right here, was being transformed into senior housing. So we looked at this particular one story uh, vacant building and, and thought about how that could become a one-stop shop for employment services to benefit local residents. So they wouldn't have to go to downtown Huntington to, uh, to you know, get uh, services and to get new things related to employment and job opportunities. Also, again, the murals celebrating the culture here, uh, the streetscape improvements, really trying to emphasize renovation of those single family homes throughout. And here we are back at the Memphis Tenancy Garrison House, uh, which again had been vacant for a number of decades here in the, in the, uh, on the left side of the frame. So the community really envisioned this space as uh, being not only a historic building that was preserved, but a new museum in a community space that could serve the existing residents of the neighborhood. <clears throat> so we wanted to show how that could potentially be redesigned and improved just simple things like landscaping and ornamental um, ornamental fencing along the sidewalk, uh, gathering spaces outside, new lighting, uh, things like crosswalk murals that could again celebrate the history and the culture, the renovation of some of those single family homes along that 10th Avenue corridor, which is right here, and using it as an anchor for our housing strategy. So this is the, the overall housing strategy for the plan and it's a three phase approach where we had the former Northcott Court site right here on Hal, Gre Hal Greer with the grocery store as a key element. We had that 10th Avenue corridor going here back towards the renovated Memphis Tennessee Garrison House. So you can see how that block is anchored on one end by the Garrison House and on one end by new multifamily or mixed use development. The renovated AD Lewis Center here, another key ingredient. And then the third phase, looking at potential owner uh, single family housing that would be workforce housing for uh, employees of the hospital back in this area. So putting together a strategy that would really meet the needs of all types of new residents coming into the community. <clears throat> so I'm gonna pause here. Uh, I have a, about a three minute video for you to, to see the uh, some of the renovation efforts going on at the Memphis Tennessee Garrison House. And, hearing it from the perspective of one of the local residents. So Christine's gonna put this on for us.
Thank you, Christine. So just to wrap up the presentation, again, that gives you a, a really good flavor as to many of the elements that could be incorporated in choice neighborhoods dealing with both urban design and historic preservation. But how do you, if you're a community that is interested in this grant opportunity, how does it really work? Well, there's, there's two key elements. You have your planning and action grant, uh, which is on the left side. The planning and action grant can provide approximately $350,000 for a planning process and about $950,000 for an action project that could really be a catalyst redevelopment project for the neighborhood. Let me see. All right, am I back? Christine, am I good? Yes, you're good to go, yep. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of rewind a sec. So. How do you, how do you, uh, if you're interested in being part of the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative, how do you apply and how does it look? Uh, well, there is two key elements. You have your planning and action grant on the left side, which provides up to about $350,000 for a planning process and approximately $950,000 for an action project if you're interested in um, applying for those funds as well. The Grantees are typically a combination of either a municipality, a public housing authority, uh, maybe a community organization, but the, uh, the core constituency is the residents of the public housing site or the, um, or the uh, other, other affordable housing site at the center of the effort. So if you were to uh, apply for a choice planning and action grant, uh, the HUD releases a, a notice of funding availability, which is a, also known as a NOFA. We're really expecting that NOFA for the planning and action grant to come out any day now. The uh, NOFA last year came out in April, so we're a couple months behind based on uh, the based on COVID and other other things that are going on in the world. But if you or your community is interested, uh, now's the time to start to. Um, have those those conversations around the planning and action grant. Once the NOFA is released, you have about two months to put together your grant application, which includes the coordination, the visit, and the meetings with residents, um, the actual grant writing itself, and then the, the grant submittal to HUD. Uh, once submitted, HUD typically takes about three or four months to review all the applications and score them, and then awards um, a handful. I think there were four or five planning and action grant awards in 1999. I'm sorry, 19, 2019. I'm way off in 2019. <clears throat> so once you go through a, a two year long planning process, like, like I've shown here in Brownsville and Huntington, you then have the opportunity to apply for what's called an implementation grant, which can provide up to about $30 million to rebuild that distressed housing, uh, do a lot of the neighborhood improvements, and also uh, put together those people projects that help connect people to opportunity. So that's kind of how it works overall. So a couple of the other uh, success stories I just want to share very briefly. With action funding, uh, Shreveport, Louisiana was able to take a million dollars and to build a kitchen incubator in their choice neighborhood that would train uh, residents to become chefs and to help new businesses incubate and, and uh, become more vital uh, in the in the restaurant field. So this opened about a year ago, and I, I think it's a, a great success story for the action funding. The implementation funding, of course, it's very competitive. Uh, the, the planning, uh, the choice plan that I was able to work on in Flint, Michigan, was awarded the $30 million implementation funding and they're now uh, building their first phase of replacement housing which is called Clark Commons in an area of opportunity in Flint. But there are many other communities that have taken the plan and implemented it in their own way without the without the implementation funding. The Rockford plan I worked on in 2012 to 2014, uh, they were able to achieve a number of successes, not the least of which is the first phase of their replacement housing called uh, the Grove at Keith Creek, which is a mixed income uh, housing development and again, in an area of opportunity within Rockford, Illinois. So there are a lot of ways to take the projects and initiatives that come out of the choice plan and, and to make them a reality. 
But going back to our uh, original slide, Mrs. Villarreal, thinking about empowerment again. Um, so as I mentioned at that, at the Choice Headquarters, we were able to have a number of different programs, uh, one of which being a citizenship program. Uh, Mrs. Villarreal participated in the citizenship classes that were held at the Choice Headquarters. And a couple of years ago, she was able to achieve her US citizenship uh, based on those classes. So you can really see how the program can help change people's lives. From there, she's taken her leadership skills that she's learned through Choice, and she's actually become a resident commissioner for the housing authority of the city of Brownsville. So now she's plugged into the leadership of the housing authority and she's helping to improve communities throughout the city itself. So I love to be able to, to talk about her growth as a resident leader, as a community ambassador and how it fits within the overall structure of the Choice Neighborhoods Plan. So again, listening and learning, incredibly important and doing it in ways that are meaningful and creative engaging to empower the local residents, um, finding ways to provide stipends for the residents to become liaisons and to take an even bigger role in the planning process. And then partnering and building, uh, like the example from the Memphis, Tennessee Garrison House, looking at partners like local foundations to make these projects a reality is the only way that they get done. So thank you very much. I think I hit, uh, about, it's, I think we have about 23 minutes or so for questions and answers. I'd love to be able to have more dialogue with you all on this. And I think I'm gonna now turn it over to Christine. Christine, can you hear me? Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> and I always tell everyone, don't forget to unmute yourself and then I do it myself. Um, if you want to go ahead and turn your webcam on, we can get started here. We do have a bunch of questions that we can get get going with here. Um, the first one is uh, one of your first examples. Um, you said that you had the opportunity to pay the local community ambassadors to help with the process. Um, so logistically, how did that work? Were they put under a contract? Were they subs? Was it a specific budget, a stipend? What, yeah. How did all that work? Yeah, it was a line item in our, our overall budget for the choice plan, but it was essentially a stipend for the residents because we wanted to ensure that it didn't affect their income. Um, because it, if as your income rises, your rent would rise and if you live in public housing. So it was a it was kind of a monthly stipend, uh, which was provided to them based on their involvement in the plan. And, they, and that, the housing authority was able to pay them a stipend throughout the two year long process. OK, um, going along with that program. You mentioned that um, in, in a recent project, maybe that you stopped the uh, engagement because of COVID. Was it because it wasn't possible or not seen as equitable because it would have to go virtual and not everyone had access? What, mm -hmm. what was sort of the impetus to stop? Yeah, so I was working in Rome, Georgia, and, and we had gotten, we had just finished our first big community workshop in mid-March. And unfortunately, Rome and that part of Northwest Georgia was uh, hit pretty hard early on by uh, COVID. So the, the city itself and the housing authority went into a, a bit of a lockdown procedure and canceled all, all uh, other public gathering events. And one of the challenges that we had uh, in terms of keeping the project moving forward is that many residents that live in public housing do not have the greatest access to technology. So they can't really, they can't sit in a webinar like this because they may not have a computer, they may not have Wi-Fi in their units. Uh, many of them access technology through their cell phones and that's really the only way they, they, they have uh, available to do that. So the director of the housing authority in, uh, in Rome decided to just take a, a pause on the effort and uh, just be able to take that time to uh, reflect on what we had heard so far in the process. And hopefully they'll, they'll be able to get it going again and, and retooling here at the end of the summer. But working with residents of very low income neighborhoods and public housing 
you do have those issues related to technology and how you're going to engage. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, let's keep on this topic for another minute. We've, we're getting a lot of questions about the ambassador program. Um, <laughs> this is a good question. Um, did the community ambassadors get some kind of introduction to planning process or, or, or some kind of training or, or some a prologue of any kind? Absolutely. So we did right when the ambassadors uh, were selected and they actually went through a, kind of an interview process like it would be a job. They weren't just handpicked. Uh, once they were selected, we did a I think we did a two day long training where we introduced them to what Choice Neighborhoods was. Uh, we talked about facilitation methods. Uh, we talked about terminology, which is the big one. You know, we as planners use a lot of jargon. So we, we really try to make sure that people understood what we were talking about so that they can relay that information to their neighbors. We provided materials like frequently asked questions that they could utilize to uh, pass out to other residents. But we also spent a lot of time touring the community with them so we could learn from them uh, about what makes the neighborhood tick and really what are the some of the key challenges and the opportunities. But beyond that that first early two-day training session, every time we came to town, every time we were going to do a community meeting or a workshop, we, we made sure we had several hours with our ambassadors to get them up to speed on the activity or on the uh, the uh, the planning exercise that we were going to be doing so that they would feel really comfortable to be able to facilitate it. So that, that was very helpful throughout. So it isn't just a one-time deal. You have to continue to um, to really help build them, build their skills throughout the process. And when you mentioned that they that they go through almost an interview process, could could you kind of dive a little deeper in in kind of what it what it takes to to be one of these ambassadors? What you're looking for? Yeah, I think the main thing is that we were looking for uh, the the two things would be communication skills, um, having having some sort of network with local residents but also really people that are going to, to take an initiative and be reliable because it is a, you know, it is a year and a half to two year long commitment. And we wanted to make sure that, that the people that signed up on day one were going to be with us throughout uh, towards the end. And of course you have, I think in Brownsville, we had one ambassador who uh, didn't quite make it through for one reason or another, and, but we were then able to bring on a replacement ambassador um, who would help kind of fill the role. So, but overall, I, th I think they really, they got more and more excited as they went through the process and saw some of what could come out of it. And they, they became the champions of the plan, um, which again is critical to the success of such a comprehensive effort like this. Um, I, I, I think you alluded to, uh, I could be wrong, that um, the ambassadors might have received different levels of compensation depending on how involved they were, and even if, if that is the case or if not. Are you able to tell us generally how much they were compensated? There's actually quite a few questions about that, um, particularly I, I'm sure that um, the amount of compensation might drive their interest to continue. Uh, through the program, so folks are just wondering how much they were compensated. Yeah, I I can't remember the exact number offhand, but I believe it was somewhere in the range of um, two to three hundred dollars a month for their effort. So it was not an insignificant amount. And but we asked a lot of them. I mean, they were they were the face of the project. A lot of at a lot of meetings, they would be going out to um, smaller community meetings and local churches. They had to uh, really help with the overall needs assessment survey, which is a survey of all the local residents of that, of each of the, of, well, especially in Brownsville, the public housing site, but then in the com community as a whole. So, you know, I think that uh, for them, a lot of, a lot of the ambassadors obviously have a very low income, they're living in public housing. And uh, I think another thing that the, the housing authority did that that I thought was really great was um, provide just simple things like new t-shirts for them to wear and then blazers that were fitted um, so that they could go out and look professional. They may not have those types of clothes where they could then go, you know, go to a city council meeting and feel like they belong there. So housing authority, city of Brownsville, 
Carla Mancha, who's the executive director, fantastic uh, relationship with the residents and fantastic communication and helping them uh, to, to become empowered through this process. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, Th this is good. Um, how do you get some of these ambassadors to kind of almost think outside the box, um, particularly so in, in this question, there are many things that uh, always in, in the past have seemed to be for uh, white white people, like bike lanes or, you know, those that are more affluent. Um, and how do we how do we get folks in the low income community to realize no this is for you too you can come up with these ideas too and you can have this it's not just for one certain type of people uh, how do you get them to think kind of outside the box and about some of these areas that you know they just kind of think are hands off yeah I think the the number one thing that's worked from my perspective in, in working in uh, these types of communities is uh, to conduct site visits and field trips with the residents to other communities so they could kick the tires on a lot of the things that we're talking about. Uh, for example, I was I was working on a, a master plan and public housing site in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We're looking to redevelop it as a mixed income site and do a lot of these great neighborhood improvements around it. Well, there wasn't anywhere in Tulsa that you could point to to say this is kind of what we're talking about and um, these are some of the, the examples. So. We, we took a, a, lot, a number of the community ambassadors and the residents to Dallas, and we spent a day and a half uh, touring with the Dallas Housing Authority, visiting sites that had been redeveloped, not only uh, looking and tasting and touching and feeling those sites and getting a sense of that, but having the opportunity for our residents to talk to their residents about the process and what went into it and their perspective on it gave them the confidence that uh, this was going to uh, benefit their lives and it wasn't just going to be something that was done and then they were pushed out and they'd never be able to benefit from it. So whenever you have the chance to bring a community or a group of community members to another place of a similar type of neighborhood that has already seen some transformation happen, it's a great way for them to get a, a better understanding of it rather than me just talking up up there showing pictures or you know giving my perspective uh, as an outsider and as somebody who's not from the community so I, I really strongly encourage you to be able to try to do that whenever you you can um there's been a couple questions about um low-income communities uh, you know receiving new uh new services and then folks from maybe more affluent communities kind of coming in and taking over their space is that an issue that you find is that something that is concerning and um what do you think about that i mean obviously the the big g word is um gentrification is is uh is something that everyone's thinking about whether it's a you know a tangible reality in the neighborhood or not so we go into it think, talking about development without displacement. Um, some of the choice neighborhood areas in Austin in particular was really feeling a real push in that neighborhood uh, as new development came in and housing prices uh, started to go through the roof. So we had to, we had to approach it in a different way. Uh, I would say the majority of the areas that I worked on uh, had had severe disinvestment and um, you know, a, a, a large number of opportunity sites and vacant land where new development could come in and not really cause a negative impact. And honestly, I think the thing that residents are more interested in is how do we bring services and how do we bring other amenities into the neighborhood where you don't have a grocery store, you don't have a, you know, a pharmacy, you don't have things like that before they, before they're concerned about uh, the real push and pull of gentrification. They they they're looking for those those types of services that show that they're that they're a real a vital neighborhood and um, that they're really uh, that they're important and they they belong there. And being able to bring those um, the Rockford example from 2012, one of the great success stories was the opening of a small grocery store 
after the, the, plan, the plan was complete. And it was a new commercial establishment in an area that I hadn't seen any in decades. And the very first day that, gro that grocery store opened, they had over 100 people in line looking for, uh, looking to work there and filling out their job applications. So I think that is more, um, that's more tangible for many of the residents that I've been able to in encounter along the way is how do we bring those services and those quality of life things to the neighborhood so that um, people can really live a, a more fulfilling, uh, more fulfilling life. Um, let's dig a little deeper into the gentrification conversation. Um, this question is, is I think, well stated. Um, mm -hmm. Was was gentrification ever a concern? Um, I'm sorry. No, I'm going to switch over to this question here. There's a couple of them. Um, so what, when when you say replacing public or affordable housing with mixed income housing, um, how do you avoid, we talked about this a little bit, displacing the residents? Um, yeah. It seems like gentrification veiled as mixed income housing. So um, are you just increasing density and just essentially adding more units? Like, how is that working? So, yeah. and there's a couple questions that are very similar to that. Yeah, it's a different strategy in different communities, but I think one of the things that is critical to the HUD Choice Neighborhoods Initiative is the assurance of a one-for-one -one replacement of the very low-income units. So from day one, we make sure that that message is loud and clear. Um, some neighborhoods choose to replace all of those units on site using increased density. Other communities look at a more dispersed approach like we had in Huntington where we had a three-phase approach to replacing those public housing units in a, in a mixed income context. And then in other areas like in, in Rockford, they built their first phase and actually in Flint as well, they built their first phase of housing on the other side of town in an area that, that uh, was closer to opportunities, closer to schools and shopping and services because the original public housing site was in an isolated area or was built in a floodplain and never should have been built there in the first place. So there's different ways of doing that. Uh, just, you know, obviously you need to be really cognizant of the local market. It's a lot easier to incorporate workforce and market rate housing in a development in Austin, Texas than it is in Flint, Michigan. So uh, doing that market study as part of the process will help uh, really justify the mix and then from there you have the program and then you can you can really think about how this works either on the site or in the neighborhood or the the regional scale okay um let's talk money for a second uh first question in any of of the projects that, that you worked in in these examples were you able to use um historic preservation tax credits for anything um, I can't think offhand at where those were used. Uh, I may not have the, the insight on that. I know on a couple of the public housing sites, including in Austin, we had we we uh, seek to preserve a number of the existing public housing buildings and to adaptively reuse those buildings as part of a larger redevelopment effort. Uh, in Brownsville, we were we were trying to maintain one of the existing two-story buildings as a community space. Um, you know, I think in the example of the the Memphis, Tennessee Garrison House, the the uh, owner of the house, the Carter G. Woodson Foundation, is exploring using tax credits. We've also looked at other opportunities like the African American Cultural Heritage Fund, which is through the the National Trust for preserving uh, sites that are particular to African-American culture and history. So, you know, I think that is always on the menu uh, in terms of how we find resources to bring these buildings back to life. Okay. Um, your choice neighborhood projects, how, how, are, how are they funded? Is it a good mix of government and private investment? Um, how does it kind of seem to shake shake out? Yeah, so the the planning grant itself, uh, the requirement, if you're going to go for that, I would say it's you know 1.3 million for the planning and action funding. And again, that number changes year after year, so don't quote me on that. But there's a requirement for a five percent match 
either from uh, you know a local partner, the housing authority, the city, or another entity that they're going to bring some money to the table for that planning process. Uh, if you're going for that $30 million implementation grant, of course, there's a, a bigger match that's required. And a lot of times it gets into the, uh, the low income housing tax credits, uh, other foundational dollars that can be brought to the table. As well, 30 million is, is a great number. Um, you know, a typical redevelopment of the size of uh, in Flint, Michigan or in Shreveport is a $100 million project. So a lot of resources have to be brought to it. For the smaller, I would say the people in the neighborhood projects, uh, in the plans that that we that we do, we really outline the the potential lead organizations who could help help really um, shepherd that project forward. And a lot of times, it is not the housing authority, it is not the city, but it could be an entity like the United Way. And then we identify grant opportunities that can that can make that happen. And some of those are fairly small. You may have a project that that may only take five to ten thousand dollars to implement, and then you may have a you know a large park or a, a new corridor reinvestment project that's multi-million dollar it's going to require uh, funding from cdbg and other sources like that so it really depends on the, the scale and the scope of the project overall okay um specifically brownsville do you uh do you know the total amount of investment and including everybody private and public yeah so when we com we completed the Brownsville plan in 2018, I believe, uh, they went for an implementation grant that year. They were not successful. And the next year, instead of going for it again, they decided to hold back because they're actually, they're converting their portfolio into uh, what's called the Rental Assistance Demonstration Program, which is a, a new HUD program, also known as RAD. And once you've converted your, your whole portfolio, you're not able to then um, go after an implementation grant. So what they're doing is really trying to uh, use use other sources like LIHTC, Low Income Housing Tax Credits, to move their housing project or their housing strategy forward. But in doing so, they're also leaning heavily on local partners for those people in the neighborhood projects, uh, like those the working, working very closely with the city of Brownsville on streets improvements and walkability improvements. Uh, there's a major corridor, a block from the, the housing site that is looking, that, that is getting federal money for uh, reinvestment and in public infrastructure. So it's coming from a lot of different sources. And one of the things that I think is critical when you're done with that two-year plan is to establish a implementation entity or an implementation group that is going to then shepherd your projects forward. Um, so it could be led by a single organization or it could be a consortium of partners who were probably involved throughout the creation of the plan. But I think once you get to that part where you finalize that plan, if it's not being used as a roadmap to go out and, and find resources and to, to bring in uh, the money that, that is necessary for such a comprehensive neighborhood improvement strategy, um, it tends to just sit on the shelf. So. Brownsville has been very proactive, both from the lead of the housing authority itself and from the city side in marshalling resources uh, towards this planning effort. And, you know, they're constantly looking at, at new grants that can that can be uh, obtained to fit some of the different education and the uh, safety and security and the other types of actions and initiatives that have been outlined in the plan. So I don't have a hard number for you. And, uh, if you'd like to email me, I can put you in touch with uh, with the representative from the city and the housing authority to give you more information. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, um, and it's going to kind of ping pong off of something you had just said about I think uh, local cities involvement. Um, I, I'm assuming that the, these choice neighborhood projects are supported by the local government. Um, ha have do you have any examples of, of master plans or any kind of uh, uh, citywide plans that are used uh, to support the development of these projects? Yeah, absolutely. So a great example was in Flint, Michigan. Right before we began the Choice Neighborhoods Plan, they had just completed their their uh, like two year long Imagine Flint comprehensive planning effort, and that that really took a deep dive into 
um, thinking about the, the holistic strategies for improving the city of Flint, um, uh, you know, a city that's essentially a shrinking city and thinking about how some parts of the city uh, kind of t should be uh, kind of going back to nature and that other parts of the city should be redeveloped and reinvested. So we used that as the starting point for all of our conversations in terms of our more neighborhood scaled choice effort. And it, it was really critical to uh, connecting in what we wanted to do in that South Flint neighborhood to the broader regional and citywide goals. So, you know, the, the, the vision in Flint is to let that public housing site, which was built in the floodplain, go back into, uh, turn it, essentially turn it into a natural preserve and to uh, move those residents who were, who were uh, you know, out there on the edge of town in an isolated area into other parts of the neighborhood that are much more well connected to transit, much more well connected to jobs and services and schools and uh, fitting within the larger framework of the Imagine Flint comprehensive plan. Great, thank you. Um, it's it's 2.30, it's time to wrap up. Awesome. Um, this was great. I loved all of your picture, your, your images were, were wonderful. Um, so thank you for joining us today and uh, for the Urban Design and Preservation Division for sponsoring today's webcast. So we will have a recording of this webcast available on our YouTube channel, just search Planning Webcast on YouTube and it'll pop up for you. And we'll also have a, a PDF of Adam's slides on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org. So again, thank you, Adam, for joining us and everyone have a great rest of your week and we will talk next time. Thank you.